One. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is a very real prospect of a new world order. The new world order does not mean surrendering our national sovereignty or forfeiting our interests. Constitution of the United States of America. By some, he's been called controversial. How can I convince you when your ears refuse to hear? You turn your heart away from me each time when I draw near. Never I refuse to meet with my neighbor. that some of my guests have been approached by old oh, Homeland Security or FBI saying, oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys that they're listening this morning is, go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same problem, you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies of foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. Well, it's Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of the Free American. I am your host. I am Clay Douglas. And my guest today is James Perdoff. He is the uh, author of Truth is a Lonely Warrior. And talk about synchronicity. You may know that my Facebook site is Free American 69, and I've been reading for the last two days the Truth is a Lonely Warrior, and it has a remarkable feel about it. Not only the title, which is pretty much my history for the last ten years, and talking about a lonely warrior, uh, and this book is signed by James on 6-9-2004. Same as my Facebook, same as my YouTube, same as Free American 69 on all of those alternate media links. James, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Clay. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, it's almost like uh, having an old friend on my show because I read your book, Shadows of Power, years ago, many years ago, and that was really my first uh, uh, exposure to truth in history. And I've been getting the same kind of little rushes reading Truth is a Lonely Warrior. You talk about being a hippie in the 60s and protesting Vietnam. I volunteered for Vietnam. They tried to kill me before I got there, so uh, I uh, I didn't have to go, and that was uh, 
in my opinion, that was just God intervening. That didn't want to send me over to be cannon fodder in a war that uh, we had no business being in. There was no Gulf of Tonkin, and I've been reading that you you've said as much in this book. Truth is a lonely warrior, unmasking the forces behind a global destruction. Your history is so right on. You talk about in the first chapters here, and we can go anywhere that you want with this conversation, but the first chapters, basically I think you talk about six wars, you talk about the Korean War, you talk about the Vietnam War, you talk about World War II. It's a uh, I, it's almost like uh, we, uh, I've speculated that maybe we've been in the whole Armageddon for the last hundred years, the press just didn't tell us. Yeah, there's a lot the press didn't tell us, and uh, you and I have been walking down the same path, and it's not surprising that we would make many of the same conclusions, because uh, what's been going on uh, has been a reality behind those media headlines. And it's only natural that people who look behind the headlines are going to find the same truth, you and I. And that first chapter uh, called Six Wars, it's, it's really not a, a detailed history of, of the Six Wars. It's Spanish-American through uh, the Iraq War. But uh, what I wanted to do in that first chapter, because this book is designed to reach people who don't yet understand the truth behind the headlines, was to show people that there's a common denominator that, in fact, are involved in, it, in each war was false, brought about by a deception, uh, usually what we call a false flag, or the sinking of the main Spanish American War, the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, then it was Pearl Harbor, where certainly we were attacked, but the, the Washington had foreknowledge could have prevented that. And then there was uh, the wars in uh, Korea and Vietnam were really artificially created. They were both uh, were created diplomatically and by intervention uh, for years before the actual. Uh, hot wars began, and of course, as you mentioned, Tonkin Gulf, another false flag, and finally, of course, the Iraq War, which were, uh, we're getting a deja vu in the headlines the last couple of days, but of course, there were no weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq, that's been attested to by Scott Ritter, the chief weapons uh, UN inspector. Who I and, got to uh, meet, by the way, I got to meet Scott in California at, at an event, wonderful man, wonderful man, and it was a great meeting. Yeah, isn't it wonderful when people who are there on the scene come out and tell you the truth and it really validates uh, what we're saying. And what I tried to do in the book is to uh, uh, refer and quote people like Scott Ritter in each of these wars. Because, you know, uh, my uh, experience, Clay, has been that throughout history, even though the power brokers and the banksters were manipulating things, even though they bribed people, even though they put people in government, uh, they felt they could trust, they were always, they couldn't have everyone uh, being controlled. And there were always truth tellers, people who saw what was going on. Uh, the port, uh, just an example, Captain Lawrence Safford, he was in the trans head of the translation department in the, Navy, in the Navy, and he knew that Washington had foreign knowledge the, the attack. He testified to that before Congress. Well, you know, the Illuminati didn't have anybody who could crack codes. They, the, so they, could, they didn't have everybody who was a, a sworn member of allegiance. And there's always been broad history men who would tell the truth, but you know, they always had to go to the alternative media. Now, your alternative media now, but for Pearl Harbor, and men like uh, Rear Admiral Robert Theobald and Admiral Kimmel, the Pacific Fleet Commander, when they told the truth about Pearl Harbor, they had to go to the alternative media of their day, which was uh, a small publishing house, the Devon Adair Company, one of the few companies that would tell the truth. Their books didn't get reviewed. And, uh, you know, the big newspapers, they didn't get to be the Book of the Month Club, but there's always been truth tellers around, those lonely warriors, and if you seek them out, uh, you'll find them. All I tried to do is to take those people and, and put their testimony together uh, to make up a, a great bit of this book to give people an idea of what has been really happening, uh, contrary to what the paid media, the hard, hard guns of the mass media have been uh, telling people, uh, really, it's propaganda as bad as uh, any foreign countries put out. James, you know, this is exactly why I started the Free American magazine and this radio show. When I saw what happened in Waco, I was sitting on my canal front home in Miami, three boats in the, uh, out in the uh, water, and uh, 
I, I listen to them try to justify, I listen to mainstream media try to justify the murder of 17 little children and their families at Waco. I swore to my wife, I was screaming at the television, where's the sheriff's department, where's the DPS, why are they letting them do this, why isn't somebody stopping it? And I watched the press. I, not only the BATF was in the wrong to kill these 17 little children to save them from a suspected child molester. Where was the press? Why weren't they doing their job? They were trying to justify the killing of these children. Well, they had to do it to save them from a, a, a child molester. It was part of the, it was the reason I started all this and I started the militias in the, around the country. Got demonized for that. What part of the Second Amendment don't you understand, people? I did it in the governor's office. I did this wasn't a terrorist organization. And I've been at war over these people ever since because I tell the truth in the Free American in the magazines and on this radio show. It's obvious that you've been inspired by truth and uh, righteous indignation, and I uh, thank you for what you're doing. Um, America needs more people like you, and uh, uh, obviously it's been the people like you that uh, have made the positive changes in the past, because uh, it takes action, and uh, it takes a willingness to uh, not just complacently accept what we're told, but to ask questions, and you're right, that's, well, that's what the media did not do in the they don't, they're still not doing that. They're even more subservient than before. For example, uh, last year when the president sought to make those airstrikes on Syria, CNN was right behind him. Nobody's asking the tough questions. We uh, have, have a war, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that the last 10 years plus, and nobody in the media is asking tough questions. They don't ask tough questions about 9-1 and why we not. And a truly free country, they sh with a truly free press, they should be doing that. The reason they don't do it is because they are in own media. And my conclusion, Clay, is that, you know, in any business, it's the boss, the owner who calls the shots. That's true for the media, too. The, the ownership, which is consolidated, we just have, a, you know, half a dozen uh, mega corporations controlling 90% of the media in this country, the major, major media, they call the shots. That's why the reporters don't ask the tough questions. That's right. And there was the Rothschild banking... Uh, conglomerate that bought Reuters in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s. So they started consolidating their control two centuries ago. That's right, and uh, they're not stupid. They understand that if they want to advance an agenda and get people to comply, they have to control what people think. And that means more than just uh, controlling the politicians and having their speeches ghostwritten means you've got to have the reporters and the so-called news media uh, backing what they're saying as well so that uh, no questions are raised to people's minds. It is uh, one of the most insidious things. that they, they don't call it programming for nothing. Television, they call <laughs> television programming. That's exactly what they do. There And there's no, no one more enslaved than a man that believes himself to be free. I, I, I've referred to it, I said they have refined the art of slavery to the point the slave don't know they're slave. I'm not a slave, man. I can go get my pickup and go get a beer. Watch. <laughs> it's called economic slavery and this is what's happening. They fund both sides of every conflict. That yeah, was true in World War II. It was true in uh, Iraq, every 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 war we've had, this, the bankers have been behind it, in my belief. And I, I like the chapter that you've got on uh, Satan uh, is uh, the bankers. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the banker is devil. Yeah, the banker's devil. Yes, sir. It's uh, is is this? I mean, we we're seeing now. You know, we for two thousand years we've been kind of scratching our heads. What 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 do they mean to market the beast? What is that? What do they mean by the market beast? You won't be able to buy or sell without it. You shouldn't take it, but if you don't, you won't be able to buy or sell. What what what? I mean, that wasn't even feasible for us to imagine. wasn't within our realm of imagination for two thousand years, and now it's like they're pulling it out of the headlines. 
Oh, and George used to forget his medication, you know. And now we got this little chip. This little chip. It tells him when he's supposed to take his medication, and 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 it tells it tells the doctor how much money's in the bank. Right, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right. You know, a hundred years ago, people could not, uh, when they read the Book of Revelation, could not have imagined what the mark of the beast might mean. It's uh, become increasingly clear to me. I posted an article on Henry Mackow's site uh, last month. Uh, it's called the High Tech Antichrist. You know, there's a lot of means by which uh, the Antichrist could appear to be God uh, just through high technology. You know, as Satan may operate in the supernatural, but he doesn't have the powers of God. But if you look back at the miracles that Jesus uh, was able to do, for example, there's a passage where he met the woman at a well, and the woman went about the town uh, telling the boy she met the Christ because he told her all about her life. He knew about her life. Well, today, they can know all about your life through the Internet. They can monitor your emails. They can monitor your cell phone traffic. So you can have an uh, antichrist-like figure mimicking God's powers, knowing about everyone through this data collection, this NSA-type data collection. Or just to take another example, Jesus was able to still the waters in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. And of course, his, his apostles uh, realized that uh, they were in a divine presence. Well, Satan doesn't have that power, but there is harp, which I know you must know all about. Absolutely. Uh, this show. So you could stop a tornado and have people think, well, this is the Christ. Um, you can also put a hologram of an angel in the sky. They said they can put a hologram of a, uh, a aircraft uh, uh, fighter jet in the sky to confuse the enemy anti-aircraft guns. They could certainly put a hologram of an angel up there and deceive people. So what appear to be divine miracles could actually be generated by very advanced technology. But again, as you were pointing out, years ago, people could not have envisioned this, but with advanced technology, and just to bring it around to your other point, he by himself, now that, you know, everybody's had that uh, unpleasant feeling when we swiped a credit card and it didn't work, and oh, what am I going to do? Well, if we reach the point where all our transactions are by a chip, and uh, there are places that now you can be chipped and you can go into a bar and, and pay just by swiping your hand, so the chips are, uh, you know, the, the very chips, these radio frequency ID chips, they can, uh, they can do that. We could reach a point where if everybody was chipped, uh, through the technology, that by himself prediction about the Antichrist could come true. But again, this is something that just uh, even 50 years ago people would not have envisioned. But as technology advances to new heights and it's being controlled by the money powers, we now see how these uh, biblical predictions could come true through technology. Well, we've got uh, we've got testimony about that from a friend of mine who's now dead after he revealed his conversation with Nicholas Rockefeller Aaron Russo said uh, he asked Nicholas what's the point behind all this you got all the money in the world what are you, what's, uh, what's the point and uh, he, he said not only were we going to go to war here and uh, he predicted the Iraq war with pretty uh, precision he said the plan was to have everybody chipped, have one of these RFID chips in, uh, inserted in everybody's hand. And they've already done that in Alamogordo, New Mexico. We've got a German contingent, uh, the Luftwaffe, I guess, is operating out of Holloman Air Force Base. And a, a uh, uniformed German officer went into Walmart. He was in front of me, and he paid for his purchase by swiping his hand over the reader. So yeah, it's definitely. already happening, and, and uh, Aaron Russo warned us about it, and then they, he died mysteriously of fast-acting cancer. Yeah, they, uh, they have to give uh, people some sort of incentive that beat chips, and of course, uh, so they'll tell you, you know, your, your, this is your thing, you know, your, your parent who forgets their medications, or that your Alzheimer's parent who gets lost, they can swipe him and find out who he is and see what his medical records are, if he's in the ER or your pet gets lost, they've got a chip in them, you can find them. There's always got to be cheese in the mousetrap to get people involved. Right. And uh, so they, they understand that. They give you some kind of reward and an incentive, uh, you know, cash backs on these credit cards. And it, is just, uh, it seems like the money system has been advancing towards this. You know, originally when people had all hard money, you had gold and silver coins, and then they 
I, I feel that paper money was a transition to digital money, and digital money, of course, once it's all money becomes digital, then it's very easy just to, all it takes is a few keystrokes by a government bureaucrat, your entire bank account could be wiped out. Yes. Now, to, to go, just to jump back, I had a friend that was at Pearl Harbor, and he was in the barracks there at Pearl Harbor, and they told him, told his squad to turn their ammo in the night before Pearl Harbor. They didn't. His squad did not do that. When the Japanese planes flew over the base, they were able to shoot one down. They kept their ammunition, they shot him down, he crashed on the roof of the barracks. And my friend went up on the barracks, drug the, uh, drug the pilot out, searched him, and found a map. And, and I saw this in your book, and so I had to tell you about it. He found a map on the pilot that listed that showed the location of every ship in the harbor. You mentioned that they they don't generally do that. They don't uh, they don't broadcast where the ships are going to be docked. There was one discrepancy in in the map where the aircraft carrier, I believe that was Admiral Kimmel's ship, he didn't bring it in. So the uh, Arizona was docked where the uh, aircraft carrier was supposed to be, the one that got the most hits on that. So obviously they knew about it, and of course the uh, project for the new American century said we needed a second Pearl Harbor, and uh, pretty much what they gave us with 9-11, wasn't it? Yeah, there's an interesting sequence there. Uh, a year before 911, you had the project for New American Century saying that it would take a new Pearl Harbor, that was their own choice of words, in order to get an increased military presence overseas, especially the Middle East. Then, uh, in May or June of 2001, you have Disney, uh, through Touchstone Pictures, released the film Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck, a very flag-wavy movie, which, by the way, Touchstone Pictures was not known for patriotic films, but uh, just a few months before uh, 911, they released Pearl Harbor, uh, you know, rousing the patriotic sentiments of Americans. And by the way, Clay, this is something that I found that it's not a coincidence that uh, you might remember that old movie, uh, Sergeant York, with Gary Cooper. Yes. Well, that uh, it was a top grossing movie of 1941. It was released in late September. Of 1941, just a couple of months before Pearl Harbor. Now, uh, uh, as you recall, the movie was about Gary Cooper played this. Uh, this true story, but he played a uh, country boy who was reluctant to go to war, and he, but he went to war and became a hero. Just the ideal film, don't you think, uh, to be prepping the American mind before we go to a, the Second World War? Because that, of course, Sergeant York was the First World War. But if you go across the Atlantic, I don't know if you've ever seen the old British film called Four Feathers, The Four Feathers. It was a uh, classic film about a British soldier who's uh, guilty of cowardice, but then he goes and proves himself. Well, The Four Feathers, one of the most famous military films ever released in Britain, came out just one month before Britain declared war on Germany in September of 1939. So you see these... Uh, Hollywood films being strategic release right when they want people to get a certain mindset. It's happened too often to be a coincidence. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, kind of what uh, James Forrestal said, too, uh, when uh, McCarthy referred to him as stupid. And uh, he said, consistency is not the mark of stupidity. If they were just stupid occasionally, they'd make a mistake in our favor. That's right. In fact, he was, he, uh, Joe McCarthy was agreeing with him, but they were both being savagely uh, attacked by the liberal media and, and of course, uh, high-ranking uh, bureaucrats uh, within our government. But just to get back to what you were saying about Pearl Harbor and that map, uh, the... It, it, not only is it true that the Japanese knew the locations of our ships and docks, and of course the uh, the uh, 
the aircraft carriers had been uh, ordered out by Washington before the attack took place. But that Washington knew that the Japanese were doing that. And one of the things that I talk about in the section in that first chapter, called Six Wars, the section on Pearl Harbor, is the fact that Washington was decoding Japan's diplomatic intercepts. Uh, th uh, Japan was communicating to its uh, embassies and major conferences around the world through a code called PURPLE. And uh, they thought that the code was unbreakable and had to be enciphered by a machine and deciphered by a machine. Well, in 1940, the uh, U.S. Army, uh, uh, the crypt analysts, broke that code. So in 1941, we were actually reading all of Japan's diplomatic traffic on a same-day basis. And uh, those messages would be given to President Roosevelt, as well as the Chief of Staff, uh, George Marshall, and about four or five other select officials in Washington. And they were not sharing this with Pearl Harbor, the commander of the Air Force. But one of the messages that they received was communication between Tokyo and the consulate in Pearl Harbor. Uh, the consul Japanese consulate in Pearl Harbor was ordered to tell Tokyo on a regular basis the exact locations of our ships and docks. Now, again, nothing unusual about spies watching ship movements, but when spies are ordered to notify your enemy of the exact locations of ships and docks, it's obvious that those ships have been targeted for attack. This is just one of the many pieces of information that Washington had, uh, which gave them foreknowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack, information which they chose to withhold from our commanders in Hawaii, uh, the Pacific Fleet Commander Admiral Hudson Kimmel and the Army Commander in, in Pearl Harbor, General Walter C. Short. Eden Rainey was the name of the soldier that pulled the uh, map out of the pocket of the Japanese pilot that was killed when uh, the uh, plane hit. But interestingly, the next day the base was locked down and the people were told whoever pulled the body out of the aircraft, whatever they found they needed to turn in or they would lock the base down and keep the base locked down. So Eden went to the commander's office and turned in the Japanese map. So more than uh, it, a little bit more than a uh, conspiracy, not a little bit more than just Roosevelt. And Admiral Kimmel, isn't he? Didn't he keep that aircraft carrier out of uh, Pearl Harbor? He didn't dock it, did he? I think he, he was ordered to have the uh, the carriers trans transport planes to uh, Wake and Guam Islands on orders of Washington. And uh, I don't think that was his decision. I think that. There was, there was certainly tremendous enmity that is uh, uh, a huge battle that took place between Kimmel and Washington because uh, Washington attempted to scapegoat Kimmel for the attack. Uh, President Roosevelt had appointed a commission to uh, find out supposedly the truth about Pearl Harbor because of the public demand for accountability. And uh, But the men uh, that President Roosevelt appointed to the Roberts Commission uh, it was headed by Owens Roberts, uh, who was a Supreme Court justice, very friendly with Roosevelt. And he also, uh, they had uh, uh, two army officers uh, who were very friendly with the chief of staff, George Marshall, who had also had foreknowledge of the attack. And uh, Rear Admiral Joseph Reeves, who watched, uh, was retired, and uh, Roosevelt had already given him a job in Lend Lease. Well, the Roberts Commission uh, conducted hearings in Washington and Hawaii and they absolved Washington of any blame, said Washington discharged his duties in an exemplary manner, despite the complete foreknowledge, which you and I have not even begun to touch on in this conversation. Uh, they laid all the blame on Kimball and Short, and Kimball and Short, especially Kimball, spent the rest of their lives really uh, trying to prove to the American people that Washington had, had knowledge of that attack, which they denied to them. On this whole global thing, now I haven't seen this in the book, so if it's uh, if it's beyond your area of research, we'll just move on. But uh, last month I put up a a video on my site called "The Greatest Truth Never Told," and it uh, basically touched on World War Two and what happened with uh, Germany and uh, Hitler and of course I, I immediately got outraged. What, you're supporting Hitler? I'm not supporting nobody. I just want to know both sides of the story. And 
after the failure of the League of Nations, they needed another war to uh, because we didn't vote in. Uh, the, there were two countries that didn't go along with the League of Nations. If uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, the Czar of Russia and the United States. The League of Nations was the first attempt at one world government. So we had to have a second world war to get in the United Nations, which was done by communist spies, Alger Hiss, I believe, is the name, if I recall. And, and so we fought a second world war with Germany and the whole Jewish nation, worldwide Jewish organization, declared war on the Germans, not Hitler, but the Germans, with a full page ad in Wall Street Journal to before the war ever started. And again, uh, here's a case. Uh, you talk about uh, the Federal Reserve. You talk about the Morgans. And uh, how about uh, Daddy Warbucks? <laughs> Or Warburg, yeah. Warburg. I mean, here we got the the bankers in Germany, the Warburgs, and recent. I, I I've gotten demonized here on the show for talking about Israel, talking about the Zionists. I've told people they hide behind the Jewish people. These uh these elitists hide behind the Jewish people, and they'll sacrifice them as quickly as they'll sacrifice Christians or Muslims. They don't care about the people, but they want to keep us at war, keep us afraid. Divide and conquer is the oldest maxim in warfare, and it's what we see every day with the media. But back to Germany, the Warburg supported Hitler. Hitler took out some of the central banks and started issuing Germany's own money, and it was basically three communist countries that went to war with Germany and the United States, England, and the Soviet Union. I mean, we got FDR who took your gold, made you turn it in for $16 an ounce, immediately uh, uh, increased the value uh, to $32. So they doubled their money on all the gold that you gave them by order. And we went to war with uh, Germany, the German people. I mean, even uh, Patton said we fought on the wrong side. Uncle Joe killed 60 million white Russians. But the only thing we hear about is the uh, so-called, so supposed 6 million that were killed in Germany. And I'm sure there was a lot more than 6 million killed. And I don't believe they were all Jews. But... Your opinion on that? What uh, What is your take on this? What happened here to take us to a war? I mean, this is this is like a, another civil war. We got the North fighting the South, fighting the South. Most of uh, most of our immigrants here in Texas were Germans. And New Braunfels is a uh, they probably still speak German in New Braunfels, Texas. Right. Well, you know, after the First World War. There was a tremendous debunking of that war, uh, and people realized that it had not made the world safe for democracy, or, and it had not uh, been the war to end all wars as the politicians had promised. It did make billions in profits for the banks. It, it uh, generated the uh, atmosphere which the Bolsheviks were able to use with a New York financing to start the first communist state, the Soviet Union, as you pointed out, to create the, the League of Nations. Uh, there were a whole list of abominations of what was that First World War, and there were writers like, uh, historians like uh, Terry Hamler Barnes and Sidney Fay, the writers who were disproving the atrocity stories, you know, they said that the Germans in Belgium had cut off the hands of thousands of children, this is World War One we're talking about, and historians were finding this was not true, it was all propaganda. So I'm going to read something to you. Uh, uh, it was. Uh, it disappears in the Shadows of Power. It's a quote from Charles Beard. He was president of the American Historical Association. He wrote this in the Saturday Evening Post in 1947. Quote: The Rockefeller Foundation and Council on Foreign Relations intend to prevent 
a repetition of what they call the debunking journalistic campaign following World War I. Translated, this means the Foundation and the Council do not want journalists or any other persons to examine too closely and criticize too freely the official propaganda and official statements relative to our basic aims and activities during World War II, unquote. And uh, this was carried out, uh, Clay. Uh, they were taking no chances this time around, just like they made sure that the Senate didn't have a chance to reject the UN like they rejected the League of Nations. They were making sure that the, nobody questioned World War II. And it's interesting, you can get most people to question today. If you tell them World War I was not a good war, they'll say, well, yeah, you kind of see that. And you can tell them that other wars were not good. But World War II is the most propagandized event of the last century, the 20th century, to the point that, you know, I was talking to a guy uh, not too long ago, a real nice guy, conservative activist, and we had a conversation, he was saying, you know, if we had to stood up to Germany we'd all, in World War II, we'd all be speaking German today. And, you know, I, I, and one of those first, you know, and this, I, I, or this is a church, you know, and I, I couldn't explain to him the whole deal in two minutes, but I said, you know, I, I really don't think that the Germans had the logistics to conquer the world or come over here. You know, they didn't have one aircraft carrier. You can't invade America without air coverage. <laughs> Charles Lindbergh was pointing that out to anyone who had listened back in, uh, in 1940. But uh, you're quite right about, well, anybody who examines World War II or thinks this is a great war will soon find out that uh, it wasn't just, you know, first of all, when we talk about Pearl Harbor, they knew about Pearl Harbor not only from those decoded uh, diplomatic intercepts we're talking about, President Roosevelt received many warnings about Pearl Harbor. You see this warning from J. Edgar Hoover, from uh, our ambassador to Japan, uh, Joseph Grew, uh, the Dutch military observer in Java, U.S. military observer, Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe, sent a total of four warnings because the Dutch had also translated an intercept indicating that there's so many uh, warnings they received personally. And on top of that, uh, you've probably uh, heard of Robert Stinnett, who wrote a book uh, about ten, a little over 10 years ago called Day of Defeat. He proved through the Freedom of Information Act that we were also decoding Japan's naval intercepts which forecast the attack on Pearl Harbor. And we can go into that in greater detail. But what I would point out here is that men who sacrifice their own soldiers, thousands of them, are not men you want to trust to lead you into a good war. These were not good men. They did not have good motivations. And uh, they were, I, I should mention, we can get into this, World War I, was the sinking of the Lusitania that formed a primary pretext. Although it took a while to get the declaration, it was the main pretext. That was a setup. The uh, British uh, new U-boat was in its path. They withdrew any destroyers that might escort the ship. The Germans sunk the Lusitania because of training munitions. Well, at World War II, they knew that uh, they'd already been debunked. So they, we're not going to need one ship going down. We need a whole bunch of ships, and that brought us to Pearl Harbor. But it wasn't just that, when you look at whether or not World War II was a good war, take a look at the invasion of, Pearl, of uh, Poland, which is the alleged pretext for the beginning of the war. Uh, World War II officially began September the 1st, 1939, when uh, uh, England and France declared German, uh, war on Germany for invading Poland. But notice that Stalin and the Communists also invaded Poland in September of 1939, what is the West reaction, to, what, what, how, what is the, jerk, the reaction of France and Britain to Russia's invasion of Poland? And it's a big yawn, it's a big ho hum. There's no declaration of war against Russia. In fact, uh, uh, Stalin is Uncle Joe, he's our buddy. And, and at the end of the war, uh, Poland has lost its sovereignty to Russia and Uncle Joe. It's occupied with Soviet tanks, and nobody cares. Even though we supposedly started this, we got into this war over the sovereignty of Poland. Anyone who starts to look closely at this war will find many, many contradictions, and I know that you've already discovered those. From what you've said. Yes, sir. It's uh, Uncle Joe. I mean, and again, it was uh, our bankers that financed the United States bankers that financed. Stalin that financed Lenin and financed Marx. I mean, somebody, you know, I pointed out, uh, I've talked a lot about the Rothschilds. I have a whole history of the Rothschilds in my book, Mystery Babylon, The New World Order Unveiled. And uh, somebody, uh, I said something, uh, I was talking to somebody and they said, well, you said uh, the Rothschilds were Jewish. 
And I said, yes, yes. They said, well, I, 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 I thought they were German. <laughs> and I, I kind of had to shut up there. Yeah, they were German. Yeah, the bank was uh, Germany. The Rothschild Father's shop was in Germany. So, you know, the war, the Warburgs are uh, uh, German. So, yeah, the Germans certainly had a hand in the whole war, and the bankers were there behind them, too, weren't they? And, now, by the way, the uh, the Germans, according to some of the information that I've been getting, and I've gotten this next issue of My Fair American, the Germans had reverse-engineered some... Uh, UFOs and they were they they had these anti-gravity ships that could have reached the United States but uh, you know most of our atomic technology came from Germany from German scientists didn't it well, we certainly uh, uh, export a, a lot of the scientists after their war and of course uh, we had people uh, uh, from uh, Germany working in our uh, rockets program here yeah, Operation Paperclip. Right. Even, uh, even uh, I'm, I'm not if you're aware about Douglas's book about uh, Heinrich Mueller, the head of the German uh, spy services or the Gestapo. He was the head Gestapo, of the. Right. Yeah, and and uh, uh, he became an American general. They brought him over here under Paperclip. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know that much about Heinrich Müller. It's interesting, there's a uh, book uh, that I got from Europe by Pierre de, Bel de Villemarest. He was a, uh, a, a, a uh, French conservative uh, investigative journalist, uh, part of the uh, French intelligence community. He wrote a book called Untouchable about Foreman and Müller. According to his investigation in Europe, Müller actually went over to the Soviet side, not to the CIA. I'm aware of both stories. I actually don't know which one is true. Well, there's uh, Shark Hunters, gentleman I had on from Shark Hunters International. Uh, he says uh, that Hitler didn't die in the bunker. Uh, he uh, died in uh, his villa there in Argentina. So who knows exactly what the truth is. We're, so, we're buried under so many layers of secrecy that uh, I've... I've almost decided just to write fiction in the future because uh, there are so many variations on the truth here. It's hard to tell who's who's who and who's what. Right. So it's just uh, best to stick with things that we're sure of or or pretty sure of uh, rather than get speculation. But speaking of fiction, by the way, George Orwell uh, chose to write about the future by putting in fiction in his book 1984 he found that to be a very convenient vehicle and it's amazing how many things he predicted in that book have come true you know uh, when the year 1984 came around people said well it doesn't look the way Orwell predicted they just had to wait a little longer uh, he talked in there about the surveillance state how people could be monitored in their own homes and uh, he said something very interesting in that book. He, his hero was named, uh, Winston Smith. Of course, this has, been, this has been made into movies as well as existing in book form. But his hero worked in the uh, their propaganda ministry, and they would change things that newspapers had said previously. You know, Big Brother made a prediction, and it turned out to be wrong. They would change past issues of the Times so that the Times now said uh, something that would make uh, Big Brother's prediction look correct. And I, uh, you'd look at that and say, well, you can't change with a back number of a newspaper says. But now you can with digital information. And Newsweek is no longer in hard copy. It's digital. So you could go back and change the digital information, just like you can change a website to change what yesterday's blog post, if you wanted to change it. You can change it because the information is digital. Now, so Orwell was ahead of his time, and, but he was predicting things. And in, according to Dr. John Coleman, who was a, in MI6, he said that Orwell was attached to MI6, and that's what he, why he knew so much about the world to come. And he, he said that he, he wrote the book 1984 as a novel, 
because if he printed it as nonfiction, he might have been arrested under Britain's official secrets act. In any event, it was the last book he ever wrote. I've uh, I've had him on my show fifteen years ago, Doctor John oh. Coleman. Oh yes. Quite an interesting guy. I've uh, I've really interviewed a lot of really wonderful people. Uh, Eustace Mullins became a good friend. He'd been on my show and spoke at some of my conferences sometimes. Now, again, your book is good history, and and you get in after uh, after talking about. Uh, Vietnam, you get into the plan today. What is happening today? Now, you you mentioned in here GATT, the World Trade Organization, NAFTA. I warned people about that almost 20 years ago. I said, wait a minute, you know, something's wrong here. Something's wrong here with NAFTA and GATT. And that's what led to our invasion. We let our corporations go down to Mexico. So the farmers couldn't make a living, so they were, I said, if I lived in Acapulco and I couldn't feed my family, I'd be coming up here with them. I'd be uh, walking up to try to get enough money to try to get a job to feed my family. Yeah. So it was NAFTA that drove them up here to us, wasn't it? Uh, the, uh, I was actually covering the uh, debate in Congress over the uh, GATT Treaty, which uh, came uh, the year after NAFTA, and the uh, GATT Treaty, the idea was we would get into the World Trade Organization, and there was one of those few issues where you had this weird jumble of conservatives and liberals on uh, both sides of the issue. Uh, you know, Jesse Helms, the conservative, was uh, uh, dead against it, but so was uh, Congressman uh, Margie Tafter, uh, Ralph Nader liberals, and you had liberals like Al Gore and uh, uh, Ted Kennedy were in favor of it. So was um, people like uh, uh, Phil Crane, who was surveyed as the most conservative guy in the Congress at that time. And there's confusion among conservatives because they've been led to believe that tariffs are bad. And what the World Trade Organization and this treaty were going to do was wipe out our, basically our tariff structure. And people said, don't worry, we'll be importing and exporting. But, you know, the very next year, our trade deficit went to a record, I think it was $138 billion. By 2007, it had gone up to, I think it was about $700 billion. The biggest thing we're exporting is our jobs, because the truth is that the founding fathers knew that we needed tariffs to protect our home industries. And uh, I'm very familiar with the free trade argument, and people think that if you have a tariff, it's socialism. What they don't understand is that when you allow uh, free trade to bring in slave labor goods or goods from that are subsidized by socialist nations, we can't compete with those low prices coming in from China and these other places. You've got to protect your industries. But what we, what we uh, passed that treaty, the GATT treaty, which got us the World Trade Organization, we wiped out our, basically wiped out the tariff structure. We had a tidal wave of cheap, Im cheap imports. And our home industry were wiped out, the uh, textile industry, the electronics industry, the steel industry really uh, took a beating, and that's one reason why we have this terrible economy today, and there are a few people like you, uh, I was trying to, I was ha having a hard time getting articles published because I was working with conservatives, and they were so committed to the idea of free trade, they could not see what this was going to do to the American economy. I personally would like to see real free trade, and I want to touch on something that you you just talked about the slave labor coming from other countries and we've got slave labor here in America today it's called the private prison systems whoa you got what's that in your pocket there boy you're gonna go to jail you're gonna go to jail and work for IBM for 25 cents an hour we have more people in prison in America than any other communist country out there. We've got more of our citizens in jail, most of them there for victimless crimes, for things that weren't a, even a crime in this country 75 years ago. And, you know, I, 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 I mentioned free trade. I think... Uh, 
Obama, you need to tear that wall down and abolish all the laws against victimless crimes that we're using to make slaves out of our own people and replace them with tables. Replace them with tables. Let the Mexicans, let the Colombians, let the Peruvians bring all their agricultural products over here. Lay it on the table. Pay a duty on it. Pay a tariff on it. And let Americans come and pick up whatever they want. If they want to kill themselves with heroin, go do it in that corner over there. Rather, uh, rather than putting them in prison and charging the American taxpayer $50,000 a year for their food and clothing. I, I, I just find something really wrong with that whole system. Our criminal justice system seems to be more of a criminal injustice system. Your opinion. Uh, well, you said something interesting there that I actually haven't given thought to. Is it your opinion then that at least to a certain extent that uh, people are imprisoned in this country in order to provide uh, some sort of slave labor to some of the, the corporate interests? Is that Yes, sir. That know? is exactly what's happening. These people, I, I mean, even Arizona, when I was in Arizona, they, they ran ads bragging about it. We make more than just license plates. We're making brooms and mops. We're, we're competing with American industry. And the in these private prisons, they are letting the people make circuit boards for IBM. And I'm not sure if it's 25 cents an hour. It might be 35 cents an hour, but it's a hell of a lot less. And they don't have any uh, personnel problems because if they want to get out of their cells, they go to work and uh, they, they work for Hewlett Packard or IBM. That is happening right now, James. That's a uh, very interesting take, and I need to, uh, I probably need to uh, get hold of your book, uh, especially if it discusses this aspect. I had not thought about that as uh, use of the, uh, but, but of course it's true that in other countries, you know, the Soviets used uh, slave labor camps, so mining, for example, and of course in Germany, concentration camps workers were used to uh, produce uh, aircraft parts and uh, I had not thought about the possibility that perhaps people were one motive for imprisoning people might be to provide a sort of corporate slave labor. Very well, interesting thing. Now, now you know Ayn Rand said the government has and by the way I, I read Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged sitting in prison writing my books, my first books and novels in prison in Texas 45 years ago. I was doing time for marijuana, which is now, you can now, if you bribe a doctor, you can smoke it legally in 20 states. At the time, it was a 99-year sentence in Texas. Oh, boy, if you go to a trial, you can get 99 years, but we can get you seven, Clay. I'm not a criminal. I've never stolen anything. I've never harmed anyone else. That, you know, I, I've, I've never started a fight, but I'll finish one every time. And uh, I wrote my books about the United States in the future, when victimless crimes had been abolished in 46 states and four states kept the same laws that they have today. They put people in jail. What you got in your pocket, son? Whoa! Boy, you're going to do some hard time there. You're going to build some prisons here in Texas over a victimless crime. No, no corpus delicti, no crime committed. No injured parties here. And, uh, and Rand said uh, the government has no control over honor citizens, so they got to make criminals out of us. That's exactly the setup we have in this country. In this land of the free, we got more people in jail for something they had in their pocket. If you, if a man with a badge can come up to you and say and arrest you for something you got in your pocket, you live in a police state, in my opinion. And I think that's where we are. Well, we're certainly uh, headed to the police state. Uh, we have uh, all the means for it, uh, especially with uh, 
the uh, ability of the government to, in the name of national security, to spy on everyone. Uh, there's really uh, no secrets. They can look at your your bank accounts, know who your friends are, know what your beliefs are. Uh, you know, and uh, the, uh, getting back to Orwell just for a second, uh, you know, at the climax of that that book, and it's also available, uh, you know, in, in film form. The very good version was made with uh, Richard Burton a few years ago. But at the climax, he, uh, the hero Winston Smith, they haven't quite been able to break him, and they break they bring him to the room that everybody dreads. The secret police bring him to uh, the thought police bring him to room 101. It's the uh, the room which has your greatest fear. And in this particular case, Winston Smith, the hero, his greatest fear was rats because of a childhood experience he had with rats. So they bring him to this room and they put his head into a cage with hungry sewer rats and his face is separated from these rats just by a, a one trap door. And uh, that's what breaks him. Now, how do they know what his greatest fear was? By monitoring his conversations. You know, they had the telescreens and they write the, the, in 1980, the book 1984. They would watch your activity, they hear your conversations. They knew from monitoring him what his greatest fear was. The government can do that. So they can profile you based on your emails. They don't have to, uh, you know, establish a profile right now. They could establish it when they needed it by going through your emails, you know, where you confided things to friends. They could find out what a person's greatest fear was. And this uh, Room 101 that Orwell talked about could easily become a reality. That yes, we're very, we're very much on into this uh, uh, whole uh, surveillance state, which is uh, uh, a police state requires intelligence. It requires knowledge about people. Uh, infiltration. I was years ago that um, if the government wanted to infiltrate a group that it didn't like, uh, for good or bad, uh, they would uh, have to have an agent get in. You know, they had this old movie called "I Was a Communist for the FBI." And, you know, it, to get into the to find out about the group, you have to infiltrate it, win their confidence, have an agent go in. They don't have to do that anymore. You can just have an agent sit in Washington D.C. drinking at Starbucks, and he can read you all your emails and know how whole your leaders are and everything like that today. So. That's kind of the price we pay for all the good research and shopping convenience we do on the internet. Well, it's uh, the internet's a double-edged sword, and uh, with it, they can. Uh, we we've got the ability to communicate. That's a plus in our favor. But they also have the ability to monitor, and uh, you know, I I've talked about it in my book. I I've got one pretty much whole chapter in my Mystery Babylon about the fact that uh, they tap my telephones. I had an AT&T worldwide telephone and I'd had it for years and I called home on May 20th 2004 and asked my son, where do you need me to go next son? Where are you dad? I'm on the north side of Phoenix Sacred Skin Tattoo Parlor. Oh, go down 24th Street to McDowell, turn left, go to the wheel shop, it's right there. Okay, son, see you later. Two blocks before I got to McDowell Street in Phoenix, a woman hit me. Hard enough to roll my road king over me three times. I don't wear a helmet, so I hit my head on the curb. They rushed me to the hospital and kept me drugged for three months for three broken ribs after they finally my family finally made them take me off of the drugs and in two days I was up and walking and talking having my coffee doing just fine and dealing with two guys in blue pinstripe suits hi Clay how are you doing yeah 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 are you been hallucinating Clay and I had been but I hadn't told anybody yeah, a little while. Who are you? We're CIA. CIA, what are you doing in this country? What are you doing messing with me? We don't like you publishing that motorcycle magazine. I said, the motorcycle magazine. Free Americans want to expose you spook types in. Why would you care about a motorcycle magazine? Get out of my hospital. The reason they didn't like the motorcycle magazine was I still had an income. My sons had kept it running. And in... April of 2004, the story broke about George Bush allowing the NSA to tap everybody's phones. But the NSA didn't tap anybody's phones. 
They farmed it out to two Israeli companies, Amdocs and Converse. They tapped our phones. Now, James Bamford, who has talked about the NSA, who's done books about that, he has something, a little piece of information I'd like to share with you after this station break. Stay with me. My guest is James Perloff. Truth is a lonely warrior. Stay with me. Warm up that coffee. We'll be right back. Discover what's really going on in the world that mainstream media won't tell you. At Truth Radio, you can listen live or listen to a wide selection of archived programs. TruthRadio.com. The truth. Out there. Have you ever had the desire, the wish, the dream, the fantasy of being in those wonderful halls back in Philadelphia when the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written? Well, you have the opportunity in fantasy by ordering from Truth Radio the DVD on Patrick Henry. This is, of course, a staged event, but the man who does it is so magnificent. We met him personally at Knott's Bay Farm many years ago, and uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I shared some of his work by DVD. I'd be glad to send you this DVD if you just request the Patrick Henry DVD when you write to Truth Radio at PO Box 344. Nick Dillon, California, zip code 93444. That's P.O. Box 344. Nick Dillon, California, zip code 93444. Looking forward to hearing from you. And I, I hope you order the DVD on Patrick Henry. All right. We're back. My guest is Jane Perloff. But let me take just a moment to do this. Not going to do the whole thing. Just a couple of minutes here. This is James Banford on another show. General counsel and another top official um, of the parent company uh, uh, have also pled guilty to uh, to these charges. So you know you got uh, com these companies have foreign connections with potential ties uh, to foreign intelligence agencies. And uh, you have problems of credibility, problems of honesty and, and, and all that. And these companies, uh, uh, through these two companies, pass uh, probably 80% or more of all U.S. communications at one point or another. Um, and it gets even, uh, uh, gets even worse in the fact that these companies also uh, supply their equipment all around the world to other countries, uh, to countries that don't have a lot of respect for individual rights, uh, Vietnam, China, uh, uh, Libya, other countries like that. Um, and so these countries use this equipment to filter out dissident communications and people trying to protest the government. Uh, it gives them the ability to eavesdrop on communications and uh, monitor uh, dissident email communications. And as a result of that, people are put in jail and so forth. And despite so, all of uh, this, this is a whole area. Despite all of this, these telecom companies still have access to the most private communications of people all over America, and actually, it ends up around the world. And at the beginning of the summer, the Democrats and Republicans uh, joined together in granting retroactive immunity to these companies for spying on American citizens. Yeah, see, uh, it looked like they were going to uh, uh, have a fight uh, earlier in, in February when the um, temporary law ran out and uh, came time to either pass a new law or keep the old Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act the way it used to be uh, with, with all the protections. And they did resist for a number of months. They resisted uh, from February until August, but in August, um, uh, the Congress, seeing the election is coming, um, uh, most of them caved in and decided to just join in the administration's bill. And as a result, you have this uh, uh, fairly um, um, open 
extended uh, uh, a bill that came out that, that gives a lot of permissions to the NSA to do a lot of this eavesdropping without much accountability. I mean, it basically uh, uh, neutered the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, took a lot of powers away from them, and uh, put the powers back at NSA. So, um, Neil? All right, there we, uh, you could go off into another conversation about Snowden who's hiding out in Russia to keep from going to jail for telling the truth about NSA tapping everybody's phones. What about that, James? I mean, now, now I refer to, I, I suppose, according to this definition, I would be a dissident. I mean, I, I, I refer to Congress, to the Senate, to the Republicans and Democrats as two wings of the same bird, and it's the bird's a global vulture, it ain't an eagle. What about it? Well, you're right. Uh, Democrats and Republicans are uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and, you know, uh, people think that they can get big change if they just switch from Republican to Democrat or Democrat to Republican. Uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, Peaceniks thought that uh, they just got Obama elected is going to end these uh, wars in the Middle East that, that were taking place under the uh, Bush administration. So what did he do? He just continues them. We see that uh, uh, whether it's Clinton or Bush or Obama, same trade policies. You know, there's some minor cosmetic changes. You know, uh, they uh, sort of uh, switch back and forth between Democrats and Republicans depending on their objective. You know, one reason that they wanted Nixon in uh, in the uh, 70s where they wanted this opening to uh, China. And uh, Nixon had written, been, uh, written an article about that for Foreign Affairs, the General of the Council on Foreign Relations. And no liberal Democrat could do that. You had to have a Republican do that. Uh, and the, the, the guy like Obama, he, he can make more domestic changes like Obamacare. So they'll switch, switch off. But uh, there's never been a significant difference. And it's interesting, Clay, if you go back, 1937, Ferdinand Lundberg, who was a writer for the Wall Street Journal and other financial publications, wrote a book called America's 60 Families. He documented back then that the wealthiest people in this country were networking together to select the presidential candidates of both parties. It didn't matter whether it was a Democrat like Wilson or a Republican like Herbert Hoover. The candidates were chosen in advance. And uh, it's amazing how these candidates can sometimes come out of nowhere. I'll give, I'll give the listeners a couple examples. 1940, Wendell Wilkie was the Republican nominee. But, you know, up until 1940, he'd been a registered Democrat. And uh, seven weeks before the nominating convention, a poll showed only 3% of Republicans wanted him. But all of a sudden, the big money from J.P. Morgan came behind him. There was a media blitz, and he got the nomination. You flip it over to the Democrats, Jimmy Carter... 1976 was the candidate, but seven months before the nominating convention, less than 4% of registered Democrats uh, favored him. People didn't know who Jimmy Carter was for the most part. He was from Georgia. Then all of a sudden, he gets the anointing from the big new Brzezinski and uh, uh, David Rockefeller, who invited Carter to join the Toronto Commission. And all of a sudden, he's got Time Magazine's cover three times, Newsweek's cover twice. The Wall Street Journal says he's the best candidate of all the Democrats. The New York Times runs a series of uh, articles puffing the guy, and he gets the nomination. And Obama came from North. They can, they can make you and me president and vice president if they really wanted to. If you got enough money behind you, uh, in human terms, money makes the world go around. These guys know that they can buy what they want, and they can buy candidates, and they can buy the press coverage. But you're absolutely right. For years, uh, they've been uh, running both the Democrat and the Republican parties at the top. Doesn't mean you can't get a good congressman elected now and then. But um, they, they have the control and where it counts at the White House. And, of course, the Council for Relations, which is the subject of my first book, The Show of Power, is their instrument of control because the Council for Relations has dominated the, the uh, cabinets of uh, presidents for decades since it was founded in 1921. But I'll give you a quote from the back of my new book, Truth of the Lonely Warrior, it's part of the jacket blurb, quote, since its 1921 founding, what small organization has produced 21 secretaries of defense, 19 treasury secretaries, 18 secretaries of state, and 16 CIA directors, end quote. That is, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations. 
uh, which only has about a little over 4,000 members today. In the Kennedy days, they had less than 1,000. So how can one organization dominate all the cabinets, whether the president is Democrat or Republican? There is this nominal distinction between the two parties. You are absolutely right. You know, I I went through, I tried to do it right. I worked with a presidential candidate in 1996. His name, he was the first Republican to sign up for the presidency. His name was Charles Collins. And he believed, like Kennedy, that we could issue our own money. We wouldn't, we could wipe out a six trillion dollar debt I guess in 1996 simply by buying back the Federal Reserve under their own rules and uh, every time Charles got up to speak I traveled with him I was basically his driver, his bodyguard, speech writer and friend and from Maine to California, every time he got up to speak, every cameraman on stage turned the covers down, pointed them at the ground, and took a smoke break. So nobody knew Charles Collins was running for president. This is how they control the candidates. You can't vote for a candidate you don't know about. And they only tell you about the candidates that go along with this whole CFR global agenda. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Uh, uh, money is the controlling factor. And uh, whoever they want to be uh, nominated will get the nomination. Because uh, when you control the media, you're going to control public opinion. That's what we were talking about at the, uh, earlier in the show. They understand very well that uh, through media ownership, and we should just touch on that, you know, uh, people today think because they have so many stations on their cable TV that we have a lot of media diversity. But when you look at the ownership, it's a different story. Uh, just for example, uh, you know, somebody might say, well, you know, I saw a news story on America Online, and uh, to check it, I turned on CNN, they said the same thing, and later my Time Magazine said the same thing, it must be true, you know, how can they all be wrong? Well, you know, the problem is that until the recent AOL spinoff, you know, AOL, CNN, and Time, and Time Magazine were all owned by one corporation, Time Warner, which also owns Money Magazine, People Magazine, Fortune Magazine, HBO, Sports Illustrated, and it just goes on and on. But you take News Corp, uh, they own the Wall Street Journal, the London Times, the New York Post, they own Fox, they own Barron's, they own Hulu. You know, in the big publishing house, Harper Collins. Uh, you got Disney owning ABC. I live in Boston, but uh, people in Boston don't know that the Boston Globe, most of them don't know it's owned by the New York Times. You've got media consolidation. It looks diverse because there's all these media outlets, but the ownership is very small. And so people, uh, you, they, they create a false consensus about what the reality is. That's why people have to look to alternative media like your show to find out what's really going on. It's, uh, I am blocked. We won't get the audience that we should have on the show because I am blocked. FreeAmerican.com is blocked in libraries. It's blocked at Intel. It's blocked at Intuit. Hell, it's blocked at Office Depot. Because I've got books out and I've tried to submit it to regular publishers. I won't go along with a vanity press. And nobody wants to consider it. Oh, you got to have an agent. You need an agent. Well, an agent will only take me if I'm referred by somebody. I said I've been publishing my own work for 25 years. Who would I get to refer me? It's locked up. It's out, and the agents say, "Oh, well, you got to be referred. You got to be referred to the publisher. Why do you need an agent? You need an agent." They have locked up the publishing as much as, uh, as you know, as much as they own the newspapers and the television and the and Clear Channel. I mean, Mitt Romney. We were supposed to vote for Mitt Romney. Clear, 
Clear Channel is run by the Mossad also. But they're, they're, uh, they know uh, what their goals are. They're not going to allow anybody around to uh, 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 oppose their agenda. Let me just show how old this uh, system of uh, media control is. I'm going to quote this is going Hel Harry Elmer Barnes wrote this in 1953, talking about the censorship process. Uh, it said, quote, the methods followed by the various groups interested in blacking out the truth about world affairs since 1932 are numerous. And aside from persecution of individuals, they fall mainly into the following categories. Number one, excluding scholars suspected of revisionist views from access to public documents, which are freely open to quote-unquote court historians and other apologists for the foreign policy of President Roosevelt. Number two, intimidating publishers of books and periodicals so that even those who might wish to publish books and articles setting forth a revisionist point of view do not dare to do so. Number three, ignoring or obscuring published material which embodies revisionist facts and arguments. Number four, smearing revisionist authors and their books. I quote, that was 1953. Do you see this, this battle? Uh, has been going on for a long time to get truth to people because this media domination and control is nothing new. These guys have had uh, an evolving agenda. They're closer to their ultimate goals than they ever were before. How do we fight this? You know, now, again, I'm looking at your book, Truth is a Lonely Warrior. Part of, part of my problem is self-inflicted. For years, back when I was riding motorcycles with uh, clubs, different clubs, my nickname was Loner. I've never been one on the crowd. Where are you headed to today, boys? Okay, I'll I'll be there. I'll have the beer on the bar when you get there. And I've been to. 49 states I call myself the eternal stranger I, I blow into town I set up a business I make it run and then I leave again so part of it is uh, when there's an accident when something happens when I uh, somebody tries to take me out I don't really have any backup but I've asked myself, what can I do? It's what happened with Waco. I will never sit back and watch something like that happen again without trying to do something. What we're doing right now is what I, what I try to do, what I've tried to do for the last 25 years. Bring the, uh, read your book and try to, and, and try to bring it to the people. Here's some truth for you folks. This, uh, Truth is a Lonely Warrior is one of the best overviews, in my opinion, of any book out there. You cover enough details. You know, we get locked into one thing. You, you, you're divide and conquer. Where you're, you're, you're this, you're that. We, well, we, we're, 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 we're Republican. We're, we're Baptist. We're Baptist. We're uh, Catholic. We're Church. We're Catholics. We're you're human beings, and you know I I, I certainly believe you you found Christianity, and I certainly became a believer in Jesus when Ron Wyatt discovered the Ark of the Covenant there in Israel and told us about it. They scraped the blood off of the Ark of the Covenant where Jesus has blood had dripped on it took it to a lab and in Israel, a lab in Israel, and they reconstituted it and looked at it under the microscope and the tech started screaming, this blood's alive! This blood's alive! Blood's supposed to be dead after a week, after 30 days, some, some time period in there. They told them, if this blood's over a week old or a month old, nothing we can do about it. But the blood of Jesus was alive, and it fulfilled all of the prophecies.
But Jesus also told us, you can do what I do and more. Now, I've referred to uh, the idea, I think God is alive and well, and he uses the internet today. Hell, this is the 21st century, you know. I think maybe burning bushes are passe. <laughs> and obviously, Satan can use the internet too. You got all that pornography on the internet, but you've also got free will, so you can decide what you want to do. My question to you is really, what can we do? You know, so many of us think, I'm just one man. I, there's nothing I can do about this. There's nothing I can do about that. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus said you can do what I do and more, and I think we've got the internet and we've got the ability to communicate. And I do believe that God sent you to me over the internet. We met over the internet. We talk over the internet. So obviously he's had a hand in here. And this internet actually reflects the whole Akashic records or what the occult uh, literature talks about, a universal mind. And I've said if, uh, if God is omniscient and omnipotent, and he's the only one of his kind in this part of the universe. <laughs> I think he might be bored. So what does he do? He creates us with a spark of his divinity. We call the soul. We call the conscience. We call ESP. And we got a choice. We can be good. We can be evil. We can do the right thing and we can help people. We got free choice. We got free will. Is that getting too esoteric for us? Because I want to know what I can do. How can we work together? If we, if we, the the best concept I can come up with is actually going back to the past. If we create, if we grow our own food in the backyard instead of grass, and we generate our power, our electricity from the sun and the wind everything God gave us. We don't need the bankers for that much. We don't need the governments for that much. And people are, we become more self-sufficient and we can rely on God rather than relying on the government. What about that, James? James Perloff is my guest, folks. Well, a, a lot of uh, uh, good stuff in there. And uh, as far as what we can do, uh, uh, we obviously God is a God of truth. And he wants us to tell the truth. That's exactly what you're doing. And uh, one thing I found that I, I know you have too is that to tell the truth today means you often have to discredit the lies that have been uh, spread uh, uh, throughout the world by the corporate media. And uh, one way to do that is uh, uh, through the alternative media, which you provided a platform for so many uh, people with. And I try to do with my books and uh, my website, which is uh, jamesperloff.com. But uh, we, uh, I think when they create the internet to spy on people, they, I think that they, they tend to look on us as sheep or cattle, and I think that they uh, underestimated the intelligence of people to their ability to figure things out and to use the internet. I think that uh, people had much greater success than they ever dreamed uh, of discovering the truth. I'm finding that uh, there's actually more people out there that knows, knows, knows what's going on than we realize because the, the corporate media won't report that. They try to make it look like everybody's in the dark, but actually uh, I keep meeting people who know what's going on with the Fed, who are figured, uh, starting to figure things out. Uh, just about all the information we need is out there, so we just want to encourage people, and as far as what people can do, you know, uh, when I went through a, a period when uh, uh, No Major Magazine was using me, and I was like, what can I do? Well, I wrote things for my local newspaper, uh, which had an impact, and, you know, it just depends on your, your, your uh, your range, your skills, whatever gift uh, God has given you. Maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people can't be broadcasters, but uh, you can, maybe you can lend financial support. Maybe uh, you have, uh, everybody must have some gift that they can do. Now, when it's small, you know, it's like uh, there's uh, business that say no job too small. I think that's how God looks on us. There's no job too small, nothing so, uh, so small that he won't appreciate it. Be doing it in the cause of truth, the cause of love, 
Uh, maybe it's not battling this conspiracy. Maybe it's showing your love to people in other ways. Maybe it is spreading the gospel. Uh, there's many ways to serve others and do right with your life. And uh, that's, that's all God expects of us. He doesn't expect us to do more. We're not a rocket scientist. He doesn't expect us to be a rocket scientist. But he expects us to do something. Uh, he, we do have that free will. He expects us to use whatever resources we do have, big or small, to serve him and serve the cause of truth and justice. I agree with that, James. We can all do something, folks. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't expect everybody to jump out there and start broadcasting. But uh, he he does mention financial support. Their war against us, me in particular, has been financial. I've had magazines that were valued at a million dollars one week and the next week actually I had one of them sold for half a million I still retained 50 percent and the next week the CEO's white and shaking I can't go through with the deal I can't go through with it Clay I'm a publicly traded company they're, they're, they're threatening to impeach me from my own company I, I can't go through with it no problem. I'll walk away. I won't even sue you, because I don't want to be—I don't want to be in business and dependent on somebody that's a coward. And you know, this is a rough. I—I I, I don't know your situation. You have written truth. I, I read your book 20 years ago, Shadows of Power. It uh, have. Uh, I, I've referred to the fact that we're in a war here. We are in a war. And it's really a, a war of principalities. It's a war of good against evil. And you got the choice of how you want to play the game. Some of us are warriors. I volunteered for Vietnam. I volunteered for Special Forces. At the time, I wanted to fight. And I'm still certainly willing to fight, but only for the right reasons and for the right people on the side of good versus evil. What about you, James? I mean, what uh, have they have you been targeted for putting this kind of information out, this kind of truth, and being uh, more than willing to talk about Satan being a, a part of this? And this is uh, this is where I'm still getting to. And you you actually talk about the nature of Zionism and the fact that Israel's flag is a satanic six-pointed star. It was uh, it was never the star of David, really. It was Solomon's seal, wasn't it? And Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, no, well, I understand that that uh, Star of David, as they call it, that appears on the Israeli flag, it is a, a six-pointed uh, star which uh, has been associated with uh, Satan worship, and there's nothing biblical about it. Uh, you know, they could have used a menorah or something from the Bible if they wanted to. Uh, as I understand it, that six-pointed Star of David goes back to the Middle Ages, but not to biblical times. So it seems to have come up uh, some uh, corrupted uh, period of uh, history, but... Uh, you know, uh, for a lot of uh, Christians, uh, whom I, I, miss, I number myself as one, many Christians are still caught up in the idea that the modern political state of Israel, they think it's a miraculous rebirth of biblical Israel, a work of God. And that's the idea that's been sold. But uh, as I uh, studied this, I found that, uh, well, number one, people should uh, reconsider that because the people who supported Zionism to begin with, the Rothschilds, were the same people backing world government and communism, which most Christians do recognize as bad. And you know, uh, a, a bad tree does not bear good fruit. If it's backing communism and world government, you've got you to gotta start asking questions about Zionism. But uh, those are sort of the three heads. And uh, what they're looking for with world government, of course, is control. The Antichrist uh, says in Revelation 13 that he's going to uh, uh, rule over every tribe and nation when he rules. So I always point out to people to govern the world, you need a world government, and he's not uh, just going to uh, snap his fingers and have that government fall into place. All these things we've seen, League of Nations, the UN, 
Kyoto Protocol, NAFTA, Common Market, uh, the proposed uh, Atlantic Partnerships, uh, NATO, uh, World Bank, IMF, all these things are building blocks of that uh, consolidation of control over the regional uh, stepping stones so that along with, uh, with uh, uh, communism, uh, I'm sorry, along with globalism and communism, and of course the same thing were funded, we were talking about it earlier, uh, it was uh, Kuhn Loeb in New York City that gave 20 million in gold to Trotsky to sail to Russia to, and they funded that, uh, the, the revolution. They put 50 million in the Bank of Sweden for Lenin and Trotsky, who were high ranking Freemasons. There's so much to the story that people aren't told. And of course, communism is a totalitarian form of government, and that's what they want in this world government. It's totalitarian Stalinist type control. And the third head of the Hydra is the Zionism. Because if the Antichrist rules, he wants to rule from God's own city of Jerusalem. And that's really what it was all about with the Balfour Declaration, where Britain promised uh, Walter Rothschild that they would secure control of Palestine, create a Jewish homeland. Christians thought it was this noble thing, but no, it wasn't. It's all about the Antichrist. It's all about satanic control. There's going to be a ruler for this world government. He's going to rule from Jerusalem. That is what Zionism is about. And that's where a lot of Christians miss the boat. Uh, because they've been fall, uh, they've fallen into the propaganda that's been, that's been uh, handed out through the media, including uh, much of the Christian media. This is what they've done to me. Oh, you you want to kill all the Jews? No, I don't want to kill anybody. No, mm -hmm. I want to know the truth. And I know the truth about Zionism. And you, you stated right here on page 148, Satan wants to rule the world, and he wants to rule it from a throne in Jerusalem. That's the whole purpose of Zionism. You know, when I do not believe that the little old lady next door to me over here that happens to be Jewish, it's, as I've told people, James, I don't care who your grandmother slept with. I care about what you do today, how you act, how you create. And if you're supporting a Zionist country, I mean, even Jews, Orthodox Jews, uh, I put a, a picture of thousands of them marching on, in New York City protesting the Zionist state of Israel. So this ain't about Jews, Christians, or Muslims. All three religions have coexisted in Jerusalem for thousands of years without wars. Right. Why can't we do it again? I, I've, I've traveled 49 states. I've sold peace symbols and peace symbol patches in Brooklyn. I've sold it to Arabs. I've sold it to Jews. I've sold it to Christians. They existed just fine in that neighborhood. Why Why can't they do that in Jerusalem? Because it's an evil and they're trying to set people against each other. This is, this is satanic to divide me. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Divide, divide and conquer. It's a, oh, you're, you're against Israel? You, you must be the bad guy. No, no, not the bad guy. A warrior, but not the bad guy. Because I really don't want to, you know, kill them all and let God sort them up. That's not Christian. That's not the way Jesus would do it. And I, to me, Jesus is the one rebel that actually solved the problem we got today. How do you fight evil without becoming evil? He spoke the truth without fear. And uh, just to, just to uh, give some, uh, by the way, a little bit of uh, support to what I was saying about the, the Antichrist wanting to rule from Jerusalem. Go ahead. This is actually, it's actually forecast in the Bible, you know, at two, uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, says this quote, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, talking about the end times, right, the final days, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God, unquote, from 2 Thessalonians. And Jesus himself, in Matthew 24, said that, you know, the end times would can occur, quote, when you see standing in the holy place, meaning God's temple, 
the abomination that causes desolation. Now, I know that people put uh, different interpretations on that. Some people think it's referring to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, and I think that uh, it's one of those cases probably where that was a foreshadowing, but this is still to come, certainly, and that is, again, what I believe is the true meaning of Zionism is enthroning the Antichrist, enthroning the beast uh, on, uh, in God's city, uh, the place that would be most holy in God's sight uh, to commit this blasphemy. That's where he'll rule his rule of government from any communist totalitarian style. James, I wrote science fiction about this coming, about this supposed Antichrist 45 years ago. It's a, and, and the the way I've seen things develop, again, I'm not sure I was writing fiction at all. <laughs> Just like Orwell. Yes. And it may be, you know, I mean, am I, do I just have an imag active imagination, or do I remember how we built the pyramids? It's uh, not a question I can really answer. But I think it'll make for interesting reading. I mean, when I go back to edit, I, I'm really surprised at how little editing I have to do on what I wrote so long ago. Matter of fact, uh, about the only thing I've had to do is change IBM Selectric typewriters to computers. <laughs> <laughs> what about where do you get your inspiration? Now, obviously. Looking at your book and and uh, reading it, you you've studied a lot. I a lot of my ideas came from reading every science fiction book in the Forward Public Library before I was fourteen, and I don't owe my reading ability to the public fool system. I might add, my grandfather <laughs> taught me to read, sitting on the reading comic books to me on his lap before he died when I was four or five years old. So when I went into school, I could read at a third or fourth grade level. Where did your, where did your talent come from? Where, where, what, what has inspired you? What has motivated you to uncover this whole thing? It can't make you a popular guy does it? Uh, no, you uh, won't be popular uh, with the world or uh, in secular circles or in pro-Zionist circles or among government bureaucracies, that's for sure. But uh, uh, well, the ability, of course, is just, uh, as far as writing goes, that's a, 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 a gift of, from God, the ability to do anything creatively. But uh, as far as motivation goes, it's just a, a desire to tell people the truth and uh, you know it pains me as I know it pains you to see lies being told uh, through the media or and truth being covered up. I've written two books on creation versus evolution, one called Tornado in a Junkyard, one called The Case Against Darwin. Now, it's amazing how the lie of Darwinian evolution, the idea that you could have something as complex as a cell be created by a chance arrangement of chemicals and that's how life began or that that we evolved from fish through random mutations when we can see that all ran random mutations do is cause birth defects and losses of genetic information that never create anything new. But I, we, we see these things being taught as facts and told us as facts. Uh, I know that it grieves God and, you know, as we grow closer to and our walk with God, it grieves us too. So I just want to do what's, uh, tell people the truth. We're commanded to do that in the Ten Commandments to tell, bear, you know, not to bear false witness, but to, to tell people the truth. And that's, Tell the truth, uh, as we were saying earlier, very often requires us to dispel the lie, dispel the myth that's been foisted on people. Perhaps I should uh, tell people, you know, we got a, about 20 minutes, so maybe we should just mention a little bit about uh, this book. Would it, I give a quick rundown on what it can say? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes, yes. A lot of people ask me, you know, for an update on Shadows of Power, I give a lot of PowerPoint talks, and uh, uh, actually diverted from the discussing political issues to go into the creation evolution debate because I saw how 
it turned evolution teaching people we all evolved from random processes and so forth really gave, made people give up on the Bible, a lot of them, and turned people into atheists, including me, and who has the importance of that, but in the last 10 years, I've been drawn back into the whole issue of politics and what's going on in our world uh, uh, on a political scale with the wars, the false flags, because things in our economy, things have been getting worse and worse. So, uh, tr uh, Truth is a Lonely Warrior, my new book, is an update on the shadows of power, but whereas the shadows of power simply was about the Council on Foreign Relations and control over American foreign policy driving us towards world government, this book is much more comprehensive. So it talks about all the false flags, beginning with the main space mark war, that's the first chapter. Then the second power is about the powers that be, the controlling families, how the, uh, they pre-select the presidential candidates and control them through the CFR. The third chapter is on the Fed, now it generates money from nothing. Uh, how they control the stock market by uh, controlling interest rates, how they uh, turned uh, what was supposed to be a congressional responsibility, the control of currency into private hands. The uh, fourth chapter is a specific example of how this cartel has run government policy, how they created the UN, the Marshall Plan, World Bank, and so forth. Fifth chapter is on Vietnam, so I felt that war needed a chapter on its own, the no-win war that could have been won. Uh, chapter six is about what they're planning today with you know, turning NAFTA into a North American Union and uh, the so-called war on terror. And chapter seven is about media control. Uh, chapter eight is about how they've destroyed nations by fragmentizing them through immigration policies, severing uh, European nations from the colonies, changing the forms of government. Uh, over the years, chapter nine is about, it's called Revolutions, Marxism, and Merger. It's about how the Wall Street has actually funded communists over the years to topple the governments, topple the czar, topple other governments to prepare the way for this new world order and how they plan ultimately a merger. This is what uh, Norman Dodd revealed that the head of the Ford Foundation, Roland Gator, told them that, uh, that they planned a merger between the Soviet Union and uh, America ultimately, and that is what world government would bring. Chapter 10 is about the international control structures, the Travel Commission, the Bilderberg, the Committee of 300, how they connect from nation to nation in bringing about this plan. Chapter 11 is on Freemasonry. Chapter 12 on environmentalism, which I learned is a tool of control. Tell people they've got too big of a carbon footprint. You can regulate how much energy they use. That's what environmentalism is really about. It's about control. Chapter 13 is about Zionism, which you and I have already talked about. Chapter 14 is about 911, which of course had to have a chapter on its own. All the holes in the official explanation. Chapter 15 is about the Iraq War. Chapter 16 trying to control the arts, chapter 17, the war on faith, the whole ecumenical movement, and the degrading of Christian faith and the attacks on other faiths. Uh, chapter 18 is on the protocols of learned elders of Zion and how maybe it's not the hoax they say it is. Chapter 19 is on the cyber tyranny, internet spying, and so forth, we already uh, uh, mentioned in today's All right, let me, let me stop here right there. What about the protocol? I think the reason I'm blocked in libraries blocked in Intel, blocked it into it, blocked it Office Depot, is because I have links to the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now, if you mention this in a uh, mixed company, they said the Jews start screaming, well, don't you know that's a forgery? That's a forgery! What's a forgery? That's the exact copy of the original. So it doesn't really matter who wrote it. What matters is is someone using it today to form a one world government under Satan? This is what they say in the protocols. And everything they say in the protocols is happening now. And of so course, you're demonized for mentioning it, even mentioning it. So play, just uh, elucidate a little bit on that. Yes, uh, you know, I had never read those, and, you know, uh, for years, I would say what everybody else says. Well, they just uh, uh, hoax a forgery. Everybody knows that. But, uh, you know, Clay, as uh, time went on and I found more and more lies, we were told, I said, well, is it just possible that they're not a forgery? Uh, how about if I actually read it for myself? And that, uh, right at the beginning, though, something that stunned me, uh, it said, uh, because, you know, they, they claimed that the protocols were invented by the Tsarist police in order to justify persecution of the Jews in Russia. Well, it says right in Protocol 2, it says, um, uh, we have persuaded them, the people, right, to accept the dictates of science theory. It is with this object in mind, we are constantly arousing a blind confidence in these theories. Do not suppose for a moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arrange for Darwinism. 
unquote, the protocol. So uh, that stunned me because I've written, I had written two books on the myth of Darwinism. And I said, well, if the Tsarist police invented this, why would they bring Charles Darwin into it? Because he was not a controversial figure in, among the peasants of Russia. They're not going to persecute Jews over Charles Darwin. And so they read on. There were so many things. Uh, here's another one that just blew me away. It says, quote, in the near future, we shall establish the responsibility of presidents. We shall invest the president with the right of declaring a state of war. The president will, at our discretion, interpret the sense of such of the existing laws and admit of various interpretations. He will further annul them when we indicate to him the necessity to do this. And he will have the right to propose temporary laws, even departures in the government constitutional working, unquote. That's from the Protocol, Chapter 10. Now, I looked at it and I said, wait a minute. If the Tsar's police invented it to create persecution of the Jews, why would they mention presidents? Because they didn't have a president in Russia. That is our. But this is predicting, you know, we haven't, since we got into the UN, no president has bothered to get a declaration of war. Harry Truman sent our troops to Korea. He said, this is not war, it's police action. We'll tell that to the 100,000 who suffer casualties, over 30,000 dead in Korea. Uh, and look at the, how the president today are uh, issuing executive orders in violation of the Constitution. Exactly what the protocols predicted when they were first published in 1903, and they went back, of course, before then. They also um, talk about uh, distract, uh, let me see the exact quote, in order that the masses may not guess what they are about, we distract them with amusements, games, pastimes, passions, soon we'll begin to, through the press, to propose competitions in art and sport of all kinds, unquote, Protocol 13. Uh, now, how in the world did the Tsar's police foresee this world of entertainment, which we have today with people watching uh, people can watch any football game they want now. They can watch football all day. Well, it's just a distraction, right? Clay, people are so involved in the entertainment media, they don't bother taking the time to find out what's going on in the world. And also talks in the protocols about, it says, quote, we will absorb all the state forces of the world and form a super government, unquote. That's world government. It's all there. Uh, and they say that it's a clumsy forgery. How can a clumsy forgery... Uh, published uh, over a hundred years ago, predict everything with such accuracy. And so I don't say it. I, I'm of Jewish ancestry myself. My father was Jewish, and his uh, his parents came over from uh, Russia in 1904 during one of the pogroms. So I'm not saying this out of any enmity. Obviously, by the way, one thing I'll just add here: obviously, the protocols are not attributable to the Jewish race or any race at large. It's clearly a small elite that's talking here. The people in control at the top. But as far as the protocols go. They are so accurate in what they predicted, uh, I don't see how we can call them a hoax. And I also addressed, by the way, the deficit in the hoax claim, which was advanced by a writer for the uh, Times, London Times, back in 1921. It's, uh, you know, I've often, I've often uh, asked myself, is the Bible prophecy or is it a plan? I mean, we've got uh, the whole... Uh, 666, the whole Antichrist here, the whole revelations. It's almost like they're following a plan that 2,000 years ago they knew what we were going. Now, let me touch on something else, too. This, uh, our whole history, and you talk about Darwinism, but Michael Tellinger, who was I uh, featured on my show yesterday, has discovered uh, the cities surrounding the gold mines in South Africa that are hundreds of thousands of years old. We've got right here in Texas, up there in Glen Rose, we've got human footprints right alongside dinosaur footprints. So somewhere, and, and another one of the guests that I've had on talks about a vast civilization that was able to build pyramids that we can't build today and they were spread all over the world and many of the uh, many of the things can only be seen from the air the whole world was mapped including the Antarctica it was mapped thousands of years ago had to do it from flying vehicles. we got in India, we've got the Vamanas. So we've got a whole history here of civilization that far 
precedes the Bible. And uh, this is not to take anything away from the words of Jesus, who had an insight that he tried to pass on to us. But we've had a worldwide civilization here and probably still have the remnants of them, the Masons, the Satanists, whatever, hanging on, hanging on. And they, they refer to the occult, but the occult is simply knowledge that we don't have right now. What uh, what we uh, what might have been considered magic 200 years ago could be explained pretty pretty well, and even uh, I've even got some videos up here about using sound to levitate. I've got uh, stories about the UFOs and the whole UFO conspiracy here. I've said the reason they don't they want the UFOs to be top secret. Why it's top secret is because they don't want you to know that we could have lunch on the moon and be back in time for dinner and not use a drop of gasoline. Does this uh, resonate with any of the work that you've done? Well, it doesn't. I have not, uh, you know, gone into uh, UFOs. As far as, uh, if I'm familiar with those Pelosi footprints, uh, and I, I have no doubt in my mind that the uh, there was coexistence between dinosaurs and human beings. I mean, that they lived in the same time. However, I don't view those as being, say, hundreds of thousands of years old. I believe that those footprints are probably remnants of the time of what the Bible calls the Great Flood. And uh, in my own study of, uh, of um, the uh, uh, creation science literature, there's a ton of evidence that the geologic layers of the Earth, rather than being millions of years old, are actually representing the, the flood of Noah, which covered the whole earth, and would have churned up uh, billions of tons of sediment, leaving behind those uh, geologic layers, which we now uh, have our um, rather uh, atheistic-minded uh, uh, evolutionary geologists saying uh, represent uh, billions of, uh, hundreds of millions and billions of years of time. So I, I believe those things, but I believe that they were much more recent, um, these civilizations that are being talked about. And certainly before the flood, there would have been no polar caps, and I uh, absolutely that the fossils found in Antarctica. I have no doubt that there's a lush environment there. My, my view, though, is more in keeping with a young Earth, which would be harmonious with the uh, Bible's discussion of, uh, of the edge of the Earth and being, the Earth being quickly created by God. It could have been the uh, flood that uh, you refer to that destroyed the dinosaurs, that killed the dinosaurs. I, according to the, uh, the Bible and, and the evidence, I, I should mention the fossil evidence speaks to this. You have uh, literally billions of fossils of dead creatures. Now, to create a fossil, I should mention, uh, in modern time, fossils almost never get created. Why? Because creatures, when they die, before they're covered with sediment, they usually are eaten or they decay. There's no buffalo fossils because all the buffaloes were either eaten, they were hunted, uh, but they weren't covered by sediments. But you've got billions and billions uh, creatures perfectly preserved in the fossil record. That requires rapid burial, and I do believe that was from the flood described in the Bible. And that's uh, that's part of what I call the conjunction in my other novels I wrote 45 years ago. They knew it was coming, and uh, you know, a lot of our the, the, there's evidence of this flood worldwide from archaeologists uh, that are not uh, are not necessarily controlled by established science. Some amazing amazing uh, things. Uh, you know, we're finding evidence of. of advanced technology in coal beds and they they may not be the, that coal may not be as old as they want us to believe or as they say it is either I agree with you about the younger earth about this flood and I, I want to say I agree with you also that there may have been very high technology you know before the flood we don't really know what the state of technology was that they may have had an advanced technological state, 
Uh, we don't know, but we've seen just how rapidly technology can grow. Uh, if we look at, you know, a hundred years ago, we were, uh, a little, you know, not that much more than a hundred years ago, we are in the horse and buggy era. Uh, and now look where we're at with the internet, which nobody could even conceived of uh, back in the 1950s. We'd be doing the things we are today with technology. So it's very possible that a rapidly uh, developing technological state occurred before the flood of Noah as well. And even uh, even uh, Tesla says uh, that he's just rediscovering uh, what was already known. It's very possible. The uh, Jonathan Gray does uh, has done a superlative job. I've uh, got some of his uh, books uh, linked down here. Talking about light bulbs and pyramids, uh, you know, or, or light sources in pyramids, energy uh, sources, and um, Michael Tellinger, who I had on a couple of days ago, showed demonstrations of levitation, and I, I, I simply don't believe that the pyramids were created by slaves carrying multi-ton rocks up a up a side of a pyramid here. I just don't believe that happened. There had to be some other explanation, some kind of type of technology that we don't have access to today. Yeah, I don't uh, uh, know how they created the pyramids, but I do agree that the, uh, the idea that the slaves were lugging those things uh, doesn't have a lot of credibility. <laughs> now, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? How do uh, what what can we do? One uh, you know again we're we're just one man here, two talking to each other. What can we do to offset this balance of power by these elitists? By I, I call it one world government of the banksters by the banksters and for the banksters. <laughs> and the war on terror, that's a war against anyone, anywhere in the world that might be opposed to one world government of the bankers, by the bankers, or for the bankers. How do we compete with this? They are trying to make us into terrorists. They are trying to, they, they are demonizing the Muslims. Don't say the Muslims are the good guys. They may have been deluded, but uh, the Catholic Church, even in Belgium, common law juries are finding the Queen and the Pope guilty of genocide. Maybe that's a, a step in the right direction. I mean, if we, uh, I've asked why, why aren't our leaders, why were, aren't our congressmen, why are these banksters, instead of giving them bailout money, we're, we're giving them money that the Federal Reserve printed, loaned to our government, charged us interest, and then we gave it back to them. That's uh, that. Uh, that's insanity to me. Why well, are we? Out symbols, and uh, you know, you see these uh, reality uh, cop shows where they they haul in some guy who held up a Seven Eleven, and you know that's nothing compared to these banksters who. Actually, for many decades, have been ripping off the people. You know, World War One, they uh, Bernard Baruch and his buddies uh, defrauded the American people out of six billion dollars for war war munitions that were never produced or delivered. Billion dollars for airplanes never delivered, uh, artillery and artillery shells. And uh, this is all documented by something called the Graham Committee of Congress. They uh, published a 21 volume report, result of a three year study, but not one bankster went to jail. And you won't even find an entry to the Graham Committee on Wikipedia today. It's uh, down the memory hall. Uh, but then we get away from that. With, and, 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 but I often uh, just remark at how you have the guy who holds up the 7-Eleven for 100 bucks go to jail for a long duration. You were talking about prison, term, uh, prison uh, terms earlier. And yet these guys who steal billions uh, through the Federal Reserve and other means are walking away with a slap on the wrist or nothing at all. That, I believe, needs to change. James Perloff has been my guest today. James, tell people how they can uh, get in touch with you and how they can get your book. We're out uh, of time. My, 
my, my book is, uh, uh, sorry, my website is jamesperloff.com, P-E-R-L-O-F-F, jamesperloff.com. The book, Truth is a Lonely Warrior. Uh, click on the links on the website or go to Amazon and, 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 and uh, you can buy it there. All right, and the links are all up on Free American. I'd appreciate it if you'd share the show. This has been a wonderful show. I'd like to have you back again soon. And if you can share this, send this out, you can go to uh, click on your name and save it uh, for your default player, and that'll give it to you. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Are you frustrated with your elected politicians? Get the news behind the news at truthradio.com. At Truth Radio, you can listen live or listen to a large selection of archived programs on demand. Listen when you want to. TruthRadio.com. The truth is out there. All you have to do is open your mind and listen. Thank you.